right, y'all. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome Good evening. to Thursday Night Bible Study. So grateful to be here with you once again. Tonight, I'm going to turn this up. So we're going to go ahead and get started and have a quick word of prayer. Would you join me, please? Gracious and heavenly God, our Father, God, we thank you, praise you, honor you, glorify you for this daytime and opportunity that you've given us, God, once again to gather in your house where we may study your word. Pray, Father, that you would afford your grace and your mercy to speak to us. God, you would help us to uncover, discover, and rediscover the truth of you on the pages of the Holy Writ. God, at the end of it all, get all the honor, glory, and the praise because you and you alone are worthy of it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, I'll, before I turn this on, you know, those that are viewing, I was singing Ezekiel Walker's song, I Need You to Survive, because, I don't know, it's just kind of resonating in my spirit right now. But it's also, uh, it, it it resonates with the text that we're going to be looking at tonight. Uh, when we look at life uh, as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is not a life of isolation. It is not a life lived in a silo, right? We are not Lone Ranger Christians, right? God has created us to be in community and in fellowship with one another. So when I hear those lyrics, I need you to survive, I, I pray for you, you pray for me, I love you, I need you to survive, you know, it is his will that every need be supplied, you are important to me, I need you to survive. It, it, it makes sense because when you look at, um, not that the, the, the Trinity is in need of anything, but it is this cooperative and collaborative relationship that you see existing. Um, and God being in covenant with his people, uh, his creation, demonstrates uh, his desire uh, to benefit us. Right? That, that, that's what, when we think about covenant relationship, when we think about God's covenant, with um, in the Old Testament with, with the nation of Israel, God said, I am going to love you and keep you and 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 do something for you, for, for their benefit, right? Um, and that's what it means to be in covenant relationship. Um, and so I want us to go tonight to the book of Ruth. text and have a conversation tonight, okay? We're going to investigate some, some uh, that, that theme of uh, sort of not necessarily codependency, but, but yes, codependency, this, this depending on one another, right? The loving one another in obedience to God's will, okay? So let's start. It says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, right? Judges, 
were. Hi, baby. Hey, where are we? Ruth chapter one. Ruth. Ruth chapter one. So judges, right? They were. They were a, a good bunch of folks, but in the days of the judges, Israel was not so good, right? It was this cycle of God would raise up a judge. That judge would set order and would oversee, and Israel was doing well, and then Israel said, screw that. We don't like peace and would go off to the right or to the left, get themselves in trouble, and be in trouble for a little bit, and then they would cry out to God again, and then God would raise up another judge. And then that judge, God would use, as sort of to code. Yeah, I want, I want to come through there. Um, God would raise up another judge uh, to help bring Israel back from whatever sinful state they were, and so this kind of continues. So that's the context of that statement. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Now, here's the thing. Bethlehem was where God was. Even though there was a famine in the land, right? That's, that's home. But he left. And went to Moab. Y'all remember Moab? The Moabites? Those weren't, those weren't friends. Those were enemies. So he left home, went to enemy territory to seek refuge, to seek out food. And it says, he and his wife and his two sons, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the two names of the two sons were Malon and Chilion, or Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. So he died out in the foreign country, out in a place that arguably, again, this is just, this is some, this might even be conjecture, I'm admitting that, that he arguably wasn't supposed to be. The text doesn't necessarily say that God told uh, Elimelech, take your wife and sons and go to Moab, right? The text doesn't indicate that. We just know Elimelech said, hey, ain't no food around here. It's a famine. I got to take care of a family, so I'm going to go search out other, elsewhere. He went to Moab. We don't know for certain what happened to Elimelech. We don't know why he died, how he died. We just simply know after some time passed die, right? And she left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. So, not only, so it must have been, you know, a good while because these, these, these dudes, you know, ended up choosing women for themselves. Not women from Bethlehem, Judah, but women from Moab, right? And Moab was not the place where God was, per se. All right? They weren't worshiping God in Moab. So he goes and gets, they, 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 this is the, the thing. Hey, I'm here, and this is the selection. So I got to choose from these people. So they end up taking Moabite wives, one by the name of Orpah. I always move that R over and I think it's Oprah, <laughs> but it's Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Kilion or Chilion died. So here we see, for some reason, 10 years later, they follow in the footsteps of their father and end up dying in the foreign country. That's not necessarily something that can be predicted, but they died in the foreign country. And so now you have Naomi with these two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. It says, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Verse 6 says, then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. 
For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So this is just, I don't know if it's interesting to you, but it's interesting to me. Elimelech takes his family over to Moab, right? Because he's saying Moab, they've got food and resources there. So it's been some time. Elimelech dies. His two sons die. Naomi is now a widow. And she's got these two daughter-in-laws. So the, the, the thing that changed clearly was that she no longer had her husband and her sons. It didn't say that Moab changed. right? Moab was still, quote-unquote, supplying the needs that they, they had when they initially had come. right? Because that's why we assume, that's why Elimelech left. He said that there wasn't anything in Bethlehem too. But then he, then uh, Naomi gets word that, hey, resources have come back to the place we left. Right? And so she decides, let's go back. Verse 7. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord, this is Terry, you see it? Capital L-O-R-D. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. This, this is, this is a, a difficult scene here, right? For at least, I guess, 10 years, they've been connected. They've been together. They've been living as a family in a foreign land. They have been making it work. And then all of a sudden, devastation happens, right? And what oftentimes happens when devastation comes is this desire to separate. It happens frequently in the church. Something bad happens. And rather than staying connected, people flee. Do you, do you, do you, can you see that? Right? People come to the place, this place where there is food, where there is shelter, where there is safety. But then something bad happens, and then they decide to separate. Naomi has what I would suggest good intentions. She says, listen, y'all have loved me and been there for me in my time of grief. Right? She's letting them know, you have cared for me as I watched my husband perish, and as I watched your husbands, my sons, perish. But I don't want you all to suffer or deal with or endure any more pain. And so she says, I want y'all to go back home. Go back to your Moabite villages, your Moabite communities, because there's nothing else I have for you. And sometimes we don't understand that God is behind the scenes orchestrating the support that we need for down the road, right? We don't always understand why people come into our lives at the time they do and how they impact our lives down the road, right? Naomi is, in theory, pushing away the very thing that God had brought to her as a blessing. The daughter was a blessing to her son and a blessing to her family. She had boys. And so God brings these women into her life. And they begin to grieve, which is a natural response to devastation, a natural response to death. The Bible says in verse 10, and they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. 
they understood, at least on the surface, the importance of the connection. Right? I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. Right? That's what they were trying to say here. Agree with me. Right? You want me to go, but I really want to stay. Because you are important to me. And I need you to what? Survive. But Naomi, in verse 11, says, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? I mean, she's being very realistic. She's saying, look, the sons that you marry are dead. I'm an older woman. I ain't even got a man to make another baby with. And I know you ain't about to stick around and wait for that baby to become a grown-up. Right? Y'all remember in uh, The Prince and the Frog? Uh, at the end with uh, Matiana and, and, and uh, what's his name? Naveen. First Naveen. They got married. And then her girlfriend. She, what's her name? Lottie. Lottie. She was dancing with Prince Naveen's brother. And he was a baby on her feet talking about, I waited this long. I might as well. <laughs> right? Yeah. Naomi was like, look, I ain't even got that. I ain't got no little baby for you to even wait on. So it doesn't make sense for you to hang in there. And sometimes, saints, we could, we could, we could be in the position of Naomi. We could be Naomi trying to push away that which God is trying to keep in connection with us. Right? We can have good intention. Right? Because again, her heart wasn't that she was upset or angry with her daughter-in-laws. She just said, listen, the reality is I can no longer give you anything of benefit, but little did she know that there was a gift that she was going to be able to give to her daughter-in-law. So she says, again, Ruth chapter 1 Verse 12, turn back my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She is grieving. She's pouring out her heart. She's being honest with them about how she feels. But again, she doesn't yet realize that this grief that she feels is something, is, is essentially like a doorway for those daughter-in-laws to walk through and stand with her in support of her as she grieves, rather than a door to close and push them away from her. Because sometimes in this life, along this journey, when we experience setbacks, when we experience pitfalls, when we experience disappointments, our natural inclination or tendency is to cut people off, is to push people away when they are trying to or attempting to offer support. Now I'm not saying, hear me well, I'm not saying everybody has that intention. Everybody wants to see you do well. Sometimes people just want to stick next to you and watch you suffer and watch you wallow and watch you, you know, deal with the, the stuff that you're dealing with because they want to feel better about themselves. They may be in the same kind of situation or dealt with the same thing that you're dealing with and they didn't do so well. So they certainly don't want to see you do well. But that wasn't the case here. And that's not the conversation for tonight. The conversation for tonight is about the connection. It's about the community, right? It's about supporting one another as a means 
to obey and fulfill the will of God. So verse 14 says, Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. Right? So her confession, the her heart's cry, drew them in even closer. And this wasn't a mocking. This was... This was kind of like Job and those friends when they sat with him in silence. Right? This was an expression of, of joining with them. So, so thank you, Holy Spirit. So when Paul said rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, right? That's, that's that scripture actually being, being lifted here, even though it hadn't been written yet. <laughs> but it's, a, it's an example of that. Bible says, and Orpah. So Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Orpah said, okay, I, I, I get the hint. I, I realize, and, and, and nobody honestly could blame Orpah. You could. Ruth had made it very clear. She was adamant, look, I can't give you another son. I can't give you another opportunity to marry someone, or so she thought. <laughs> and so Orba says, okay, looking at the situation, maybe it makes sense for me to go back. And so Orba decides to, di you know, to disconnect. But Ruth stayed connected. I like this word, but Ruth clung to her. It's like that image of the, the little kid wrapping themselves around your leg and then you, you know, hobbling along like this. You can't get them off. They're just, they're just stuck on you. That's what that, that's what she did. She clung to Naomi. She would not let her go because she was committed to remaining connected. Now hear that? She was committed to remaining connected. Verse 15 says, and she said, this is Naomi, see your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Right? Do what she did. You see, she did it, now you do it. 16, but Ruth says, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. Stop telling me to go away because I'm not. Stop telling me to disconnect because I'm not. I'm committed to remaining connected to you. Right? I need you. You need me. We're all a part. I'm going to say it all through the night. part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. Right? I need you to survive. I need you to survive. She said, for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Now, Ruth didn't know what the next step was. She wasn't, it, it, this right here wasn't like Ruth was telling her, yeah, I could, I could see over into Bethlehem, right? I could, I could see what's going to happen. All she knew was right then and there and now. And remember, remember I talked about the, what, what, what God does. When, we, when we're seeking the will of God, the will of God will require us to do a couple things. It will require us to adjust our lives. God's will will require us to make an adjustment. Naomi had to make an adjustment. Ruth had to make an adjustment. And obeying the will of God often requires a crisis of belief. Right? Naomi had to believe beyond the situation, and so did Ruth. And so Ruth is trying to sort of encourage Naomi in this statement. 
in this declaration, for where you go, I will go. She's actually encouraging herself. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. I don't know where that's at. I don't know where you're going. I know you said you're heading back to your homeland, so I'm going with you. And wherever you end up, wherever, wherever motel, no-tail, hotel, Holiday Inn, Express, <laughs> I'm with you. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be. That's that's bold. Yes, yes, sis. I, I was just going to say, it just required a lot of faith and a lot of trust um, from on Ruth's part, and, and even Naomi as well. But Ruth um, has so, such great, I guess, trust in them and Naomi, and that um, she just, you know, wanted, she, she she knew that maybe she knew that she was going to be okay. Right, there had to be something in Naomi that in those 10 years she saw, perhaps, that drew her in, right? And again, this, 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 this is just, I can't necessarily prove it right here, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if Ruth was like, Naomi, you're all of God. I left, right, because again, in, in Bible days, right, she left her, she left her family to be with, with her husband, who is now dead, father-in-law, dead. And so she's saying, I've committed to being connected to you, and this is what I know. I'm not looking to go back to that. Orpah had a different disposition. And I'm not knocking Orpah because she decided to go back, right? Because Naomi urged her. She, she pushed her. Because that's sometimes what happens with grief, right? Grief will push people, things away. Rather than pulling, I'll say, sometimes not pulling the right things in. Sometimes grief pulls the wrong things in. But grief can also pull the right things in. So... Naomi, excuse me, Ruth, is in that, yes, sis, that position to demonstrate her faith. Because prior to that, it doesn't indicate that she was following the God of Israel. But she's so committed to Naomi that she says, listen, I will then follow your God. Wherever you go and whatever you believe, whatever you think, however you are, that's, that's me. That's what I want. So there had to be something magnetic about Naomi that attracted Ruth to her, that she was willing to give up all she knew in order to remain connected to her. Yes, it's true. That's basically where I was thinking, because it had to be more so that since they were there together for 10 whole years, so they became family, like you're saying, and she was probably watching her pray worship God and trust God the Holy Spirit was doing that work to, to keep her with her instead of leaving her. Right, because God knows as you were saying, it sometimes prepares us for stuff ahead of us we have no idea what's going on. Absolutely, 10 year preparation, yes. Brother Jeff. Um, it seems that uh, um, you know, Naomi lost about three loved ones uh, you know, with being with the, with the daughters. So uh, there's a possibility of, uh, I guess, uh, experiencing trauma and uh, healing each other and comforting each other and having and building that rapport in a relationship. And I, I, Ruth probably wouldn't even think of leaving Naomi, you know, after all they went through and just having that much love embedded. Right. They, they collectively experienced the trauma of losing someone close to them, right? For, for Oprah and, and Ruth, their husbands, but more so for Naomi, not only her sons, but her husband, right? That was her life, right? And so that loss 
created a void, created an empty space for both of them. Well, really, all three of them. And Naomi's recommendation was, okay, for you two, go fill it in your in your home. Go fill it with your 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 family of origin rather than your family of creation because right I'm all I'm all that's left and and I ain't got nothing. You know, I love y'all but but I'm really no good right now. I'm not gonna be any good. But Ruth saw something beyond that. Did you have your hand up sis? Okay. I'll, but, yes sis. I was gonna say that maybe with Oprah that she wanted to distance herself from the pain sometimes with us when we think that remind us of our past or remind us of a hurt, we want to distance ourselves from it as much as possible. For her leaving was kind of her way of dealing with the pain. Could be, yeah. And and and, and vice versa, right? Naomi pushing Orpah away because her face reminded her of the love and relationship that that, that they, you know, the, the relationship she had with her son, right? And, right, right? and so you being in in my presence just reminds me of that pain. So Please, y'all, just go. So, and I'm gonna go my way. But Ruth is committed to be remaining connected. That, that, that's, that's the line. Y'all on Facebook, write that one. Ruth was committed to remaining connected. And, and, and it's, it's in this, it's in these couple of verses that you see that declaration. The ver verses 16. Um, and really, even, the, uh, I, I didn't read it yet, verse 17, where he says, uh, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Right? So she's like, I'm in this for the long haul. When I marry your son, I marry into this family, and I committed myself to being in this family. And although... The family dynamics have changed. Although I have experienced that trauma, right? I still feel like we should stick together. We should stay together. And yes, ma'am. It seems at that moment that we had to be the name at that point time. Yeah. And 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 that's not necessarily uncommon for one to have more um, belief over the other, right? Because it depends on the lens and the perspective. But what I, what I, what, what I kind of glean from the text is, it's amazing and interesting, the foreigner being so committed to God in light of the, the distress, in light of the devastation over the one that actually had a relationship with God. But sometimes that happens, y'all. Sometimes the pagan is the one that encourages the, the believer. Sometimes God sends us people that don't necessarily believe like us to encourage us, to build us, to help us along the way. And, and perhaps there are people in our lives that are connected to us that previously didn't believe, but now they do believe. And they're still with us. Yes? When back then, you know, they, they, they were different tribes and groups of people and stuff. So she was from Bethlehem. That's more where Christ, more Christ focused land, whatever. For lack of a better word. So they were at Moabite, and it, it mentions that they had different gods. Yes. Is it that, did it, did it happen where sometimes? God, God was really doing stuff in with the people and through the people that the other ones also knew. The other, the other nations knew about God, Jehovah, about about, about the God of Israel. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that they accepted Him. No, what at, I was gonna, what I was going to say is sure. maybe that the other young lady going back, like I was saying, uh, to watch Naomi, she might have been like. I can't be doing all that. I think I need this and that. And that might be why she left as well. Because of the God. Again, it's so it's, much in there. We, right. We can it. speculate. We can theorize. But we can't ever be certain, really, why 
or bereft other than to say, Naomi was insistent that she go. And it seems that Orpah relented and said, fine, I'm out of here, right? She, she, she's grieved with her twice, right? Because the Bible says they wept. And then she, she wept again. And then finally, she kissed her and, and she departs. So, again, just on that surface, it seems like she, she, she submitted to the, the request of Naomi. But Ruth, right, being, I guess, somewhat stubborn, <laughs> said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to follow you. Where you go, I go, right? Where you lodge, I lodge. Your folks is my folks, right? So them folks over in, in, in Bethlehem is my people too, right? And uh, Yahweh is my Yahweh too, right? Where you die, I'm going to die, and I'm going to be buried with you. And then she, she makes this sort of like really very uh, strong statement. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. That's a commitment. She put it on God and said, God, listen. In essence, she was making an oath to be remain with, with, with Naomi forever, right? And the only thing that could break it is God through his divine hand. And so verse 18 says, and when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. I like, I love the line. It, 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 it's almost as if like, I don't know, I feel like it's a musical. I, I mean, my daughter here it was in musicals and my oldest was in musicals. And this feels like one of those musicals, like that scene that she comes in singing, I'm not going nowhere, or whatever. <laughs> and, 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 and she just, she says, okay. <laughs> like, like, in scene, right? Right, in scene, because she's like, all right, this, this girl ain't leaving. It's clear that she has determined to remain what? Committed, Committed to being connected. Right? And I believe that God is, has called us to do the, the very same thing. Not just remain, uh, remain or resolve to be committed to being connected to him, but to each other. Because, again, as I said at the beginning, none of us as believers are Lone Ranger Christians. We do not walk this journey by ourselves. God has knitted us together. Right? We have partnership with each other. And it's important that we maintain that partnership because there are moments where you and I can grow weak and we need, you know, that person to, to lean on, to help, help support us, right? Um, what was the midweek manner? Consider supporting each other. And this way you fulfill the law of Christ. Consider the needs of others, I think it was. And this way you fulfill the law of Christ. Right? It's that kind of thinking. Right? Thinking about the benefit of the other person rather than your own benefit. Maybe Orpah thought it was more beneficial considering Naomi said Lee for her to go and be with her folks. But Ruth thought it more beneficial to stay with Naomi. And so the Bible says in verse 19, so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Myra, for the Almighty has dealt, with, uh, dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought 
calamity upon me. I mean, she's really just pouring her heart out, right? And the truth is, while she didn't come back with her husband and her two sons, she did come back with a daughter-in-law. And I can appreciate her a sentiment of feeling empty, right? Feeling sort of hopeless or helpless because of God's decision. Right? It doesn't indicate in the text that Elimelech and her two sons did anything wrong per se. Right? That 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 this was a judgment against them, that this was God's wrath upon them, or whatever the case may be. Right? But nonetheless, she feels this intense emotion about God's decision to do something that in her mind wasn't favorable. And I know that's a real feeling because every last one of us have experienced times where we felt like maybe, like, God, why did you do that? What did I do to deserve it? Right? And I want to just say this. There's nothing wrong with asking those questions of God. I know maybe there was this thinking and thought process even through, you know, in, in, in church that, oh, you never question God. Well, I don't, I don't know that that's, that's a biblical a truth because I believe God invites us to question. God invites us to dialogue. That's, that's what we do in prayer. We, we communicate with our Lord. We, we ask questions. We, we, we tell him about himself. We, we, we seek his will and answers and all those sorts of things. So to suggest that we can't ask God a question about why he did something doesn't mean that we don't believe him or trust him, right? Now, I know there might be a scholar out there saying, well, huh, wait a second, Pastor Jay. When Job was asking God about all that stuff, God set him straight. Because God was like, well, where were you when I was doing all my God stuff, right? And the truth is, yes, God gets to do what God wants to do. But I don't think that Job asking God questions necessarily was a bad thing because God invites us into conversation. But God gets to respond to our questions in the way that God wants to as well. So the communication, the, the back and forth, right? God gets to say what God wants to say because he is God. So don't ever feel like you can't ask God the hard, the tough questions. But also be ready to receive the hard, tough responses. Because sometimes we might not get what we want. We might not hear what we want to hear. So, um, verse 22. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite. Now it's interesting because this is the first time Ruth is now being identified by her country of origin. Before it was just Ruth. But now she's in Bethlehem, Judah, and she's being called the Moabite. Pay attention to that. Her daughter-in-law with her who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, most of us know the rest of the story. And I'm kind of just going to have conversation. We don't necessarily have to read the entire text because we don't have enough time. But... We know that Ruth and Naomi come upon a field, uh, and the owner of that field is Boaz, right? And, and Boaz says, hey, let them go and glean from the field. And the thing I love about the sort of Israel back then was that they were um, they supported the community, right? They looked out for each other. They looked out for the for the less fortunate per se. And so there was grain and all those other things uh, that were left for those who couldn't afford it, right? So it was for both the uh, both Israel, but also for the foreigner. So you see, the I, the need you to survive. 
right? Who knows what's, what would have happened in Moab, right? She's now back in Judah. Naomi is now in a position where she can benefit from her daughter-in-law because her daughter-in-law is going to be the one out there doing the work, doing the collecting, right? So she's collecting for her mother-in-law and for herself, committed to being connected. I need you to survive. So she gets out in that field. She gets to to to, to picking picking it up, and and then Boaz took notice of, her, right? Remember that? Like, who is that? I ain't seen her before. And so it uh, it says. Uh, then Boaz said to his young man. Who was in charge of the reapers? Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is a young Moabite woman. Came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me uh, glean and gather among the sheep after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning till now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Hear that? Don't go nowhere, girl. You stay right here <laughs> in my field because I've got everything that you need right here. Have I not char charged the young men not to touch you? Uh, excuse me. Um, let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessel and drink what the young men have drawn. And then she fell on face, bowed to the ground, and said to him, Why have why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. So you see, right, her commitment to Naomi is now being brought back to her. Right? Remember, again, just think about the bit we met. Remember when we said, we don't have to hoard for ourselves that which God has given to us. We can, we can share it with others because God has a way of bringing that stuff back to us. Right? So Naomi, Ruth didn't have to, you know, she, Ruth had enough, I guess, faith, let's say it like that, to trust that going with Naomi was better than staying in Moab. And then when she got to, to, to Bethlehem, she found God in the middle of a field supplying her need through Boaz, right? And then not only supplying her need, but also supplying the need of Naomi because she was gathering for not just herself, but for her mother-in-law, right? Yes, sir. Were, were women... In, the, in that era, vulnerable, without Absolutely. having uh, uh, some Absolutely. sort of a with, without man a husband, archetype, and, or without son a archetype. husband, a son, or a male. So God restored Naomi and to 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 watch over them or protect them and keep them, right? And it was the job of the community to take care of what the widows and the orphans, yeah. as well as the foreigner. So she was to be supported by the community. It was a welfare state established by God. That's why I don't even, that's why it boggles my mind when this country gets upset at people who utilize social services and are supported by the welfare system. Now, again, I'm not here to make commentary about those that take advantage or to abuse it, but I am here to say that it's in place to support those in the same way that the Bible did. Right, the Bible days. It's the same idea, right? That there are those that will need a helping hand, and then they in turn are blessed because we're already blessed. But again, that's not right. I know it's I know it's election season. There's a, there's a there's a there's a debate tonight on that stuff. Well, I don't know how much of a debate it's going to be, but anyway, 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 anyway. Um. She, she, she eventually um, is put in a position, right? And we, we know this. Eventually, she, she's put in a position to be chosen by Boaz, right? Um, as, 
as his wife. And ultimately, she is. Boaz becomes the kinsman redeemer for Ruth and marries her and then ends up having a child, right? And that child now um, becomes, Naomi becomes involved in that child's life, right? And so now we have this, this uh, rebirth, uh, re restoration of this family and this continuation, right? We got Obed, Jesse, and then Jesse had David. David had Solomon, right? So on and so forth. So we see how God, how Ruth's commitment to remaining connected to Naomi fulfilled the will of God. And so that's that's the line here tonight, y'all, is that we need to remain committed to being connected. We are not in isolation. We are not in asylum. God has called us to community. And God desires that we stand with each other in community to support one another, as well as support others. Right? It's not just about believers. Right? It's about the unbeliever too. Right? Because God's love is not just for us, it's for everybody. And so if his love is for everybody, our support should be for others as well. Regardless of our political leanings, regardless of our social economic standing, regardless of, you know, those things that make us different. Remain committed, committed to being connected. Amen? Amen. Amen. Questions, comments, thoughts? Concerns. Hearing none, we will have our closing prayer, but I do want to remind everyone that tomorrow starts our district union session. Uh, we'll be over at Roof Fellowship Ministries in Plainfield starting at 730 Yours truly will be preaching. Uh, and then, amen. Praise God. Saturday uh, is a day of prayer. I believe uh, it starts at 1030 over at Union Chapel in Union, New Jersey. Uh, and then Sunday, we'll be back over at Roof Fellowship in Plainfield for the installation service of the new officers. So we have a new president, vice president, general secretary, reporting secretary, etc., etc. So that service will serve as their installation, uh, and that starts at 3:30. Pray that you're able to make that if you can. Um, but you know, for me, I would love to see your bright, beautiful faces tomorrow night um, in support of your pastor. So, um, and then Sunday, obviously, we'll be here for service, and then Monday night, Monday at seven o'clock. We are going to have our ministry mid-year meeting. It's very important because there's a lot of things we need to talk about. Um, so we'll be here at the church. If you cannot make it to the church, there is a virtual option. I pray that you come to the church, but I do understand if you can't make it in person. Amen? Amen. And FYI, if you didn't know, Jessica was off this whole week, so uh, I didn't see it. Any emails or anything like that. She'll be back on Monday as well. Good to go? All right, let's stand so we can be dismissed. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for, again, this daytime and opportunity you've given us to come to your house, gather in your name that we might worship you. Thank you, Father, for this lesson that has been shared tonight about connection and commitment to it. Father, thank you for Naomi and Ruth and, and their relationship. Thank you, God, that they are helping us to understand that there is, uh, there is uh, something lovely and, and something pure in uh, being loyal to one another, in walking uh, the journey of grief and loss uh, that leads to uh, resurrection, restoration, uh, recommitment. Thank you, God, uh, for your unmerited favor. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. 
God, thank you for showing us that we do, in fact, need each other to survive. Yes. That, God, we are a body ministry and that no one is uh, able to do this on their own. So, Father, we pray that we will remain committed, first and foremost, to you and God, secondly, committed to one another. We pray, Father, for our sick and infirm. We pray for our bereaved. We ask, oh God, that you will continue to keep and cover them and bless them even now, God. We ask for traveling mercies that we depart this place by your divine permission and authority. And we ask, oh God, that you would help us to get home safely. Yes. Uh, and again, God, that we would come back based upon your will where we can again serve you, honor you, and glorify you. We pray this prayer in the strong and the mighty master's name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.